Hello, everybody. Welcome to this session on anomaly detection. So my name, as mentioned, is Kevin Fiesel. I am a proprietor of a small consulting company out of Durham, North Carolina. I'm a Microsoft Data Platform MVP and glad to be down here. If you want to talk to me afterwards, I know there won't be time for questions, but if you do have any, come talk to me over around the corner here. One quick thing, uh, Curated SQL is a blog that I maintain. Every, every day I try to find and link to five to ten interesting articles on talks all, on uh, posts all across the data platform space. So that's curatedsql.com. What I'm going to do in this talk, and I've got about 25 minutes to do it, we'll discuss what anomalies are. We'll get an idea of, of that. We'll understand some, some of the techniques for detecting anomalies. And based on how much time I have left, I will show you a very quick uh, .NET demonstration using the ML.NET library. So first up, what exactly is an anomaly? And if you go into the academic literature, there are usually two realms of thought around what defines outliers and anomalies. One group says they are exactly the same thing. Another group says they are very different things. I belong to group number two. Outliers are things that are not in the norm. They do not fit an expected pattern. Anomalies are outliers which are interesting to people. So anomalies are the more interesting thing. Outliers just happen. If you have a large enough data set, you have outliers, but they may not be interesting. When they are interesting, they become anomalies. Now, there's a non-technical definition of outliers and anomalies, and that is, I'll know it when I see it. Because it turns out humans are really good pattern matchers. It's, it's something that we are excellent at. So that I can show you this image and you all see what the outlier is without me having to point it out or even note that it exists. Now, to talk a little bit more about that, we are going to delve into psychology. And I think there's a button on here that locks all the doors so you can't escape. But um, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the Gestalt School. Uh, the Gestalt School comes out of Berlin pre-World War I, right up into that run-in on World War I. And the key insight behind this school was actually around how people interpret sensory information and uh, specifically visual information. And it, based on some of the early books and papers, there are some principles that we can talk about that we can use in real life. One of them is the law of closure. The idea of the law of closure is that our minds will naturally fill in the gaps. So for example, I can say, what do you see up here? And people will say, oh, of course, there's a square, a circle, and a triangle. And I'm going to say, no, none of those shapes exist because square circles and triangles are complete. And none of these are complete, thanks to the power of PowerPoint and the ability to uh, change the, the line type. But what happens is we fill in the gaps and we say, well, yeah, OK, you're playing with my mind, but that's really a square. And that's what we do. Common region says if you put a band around something, people will naturally assume that these circles are very, very different from those circles, despite the fact that I copied and pasted them myself. But we assume this region, because there's a region, that there is something interesting in here that it is different from the things outside of that region. Figure and ground, we've seen a lot in uh, various types of visual puzzles, but the idea is that the figure is the thing of focus. The ground is the surrounding behind the figure that sets off the figure. And generally, you know, for example, if we were to uh, look at a photograph of me on stage here, we would see obviously I am the figure, the ground is everything around and behind me. But sometimes that differentiation can be ambiguous, like in the example of Ruben's vase. So Ruben was a uh, Dutch psychologist who was not quite in the Gestalt school, but was Gestalt adjacent. And uh, one of his findings was that if you have, if you put on a properly neutral background, like a, a gray background, something in black, something in white, where it can be ambiguous, is it a face or is it a vase? What will happen is that some people will clearly see one, some people will clearly see the other, and some people will just flip between the two. It's hard for them to differentiate. Now, on a background which is a little bit biased, then depending on which one, which color is which, you're going to see, like for example, you probably see the faces here and the vase there, because I have a dark background that kind of indicates to you, oh, this black color is probably part of the ground. Now, law of proximity. This is something that we take advantage of a lot in visualization. The idea is things that are near to each other proximity-wise, so spatially, we assume are similar. Things that are far apart from one another, we assume are different. And so we're able to say, obviously, these three dots are very, very different from that dot. 
despite the fact, again, that I copied and pasted them myself. Um, similarity says, we will group things together based on certain attributes and three of the most powerful ones, color, shape, and size. This is, by the way, when you're doing visualization, why color is so important, because color is uh, something called a pre-attentive attribute. It's something that we notice before we think about it. So we're aware of it before we actually internalize uh, that we are aware of it. And thus, when we see dots of different colors, we assume that these yellow dots are all somehow related to one another, that the gray dots are somehow related to one another. Another example is continuity. And when we're putting together these patterns, we want to find the most concise or consistent forms, the smoothest path. So for example, if I were to show you this and say, please create two lines from these dots, most likely what people are going to do is they draw something down like this and they draw something across like this and they say yeah of course that's the natural curve and then when i show you this it is a little disconcerting because it's not the natural curve it we are bouncing tangentially and that's not what we want to see we want to see nice smooth patterns this also leads to a notion of symmetry and order where we perceive ambiguous shapes. If it's a group of things, we try to break it out into constructs that we're obviously aware of. So in this simple example, I would say, what do you see up here? And most adults are going to say, oh, well, it's a triangle, it's a circle, it's a square. Kids may look at this and say, oh, it looks like a cartoon character with a mohawk. Uh, but as adults, we, we tend to break things down as opposed to creatively thinking up new uh, justifications for the existence of a single thing. So we put together that it's multiple, slightly overlapping shapes. And we do this because we've never seen this thing on the left in the wild. Now, if you see it, if it is actually a cartoon character and you, you look at it, you say, oh, well, this is the cartoon character leading to one of my favorite episodes of The Simpsons, where the uh, Matsumara Fishworks combined with Tamurabuchi heavy manufacturing concern to create fish bulb, which looks suspiciously like Homer. And that's something that our minds do. We, we go to Japan and try to figure out why in the world does this uh, soapbox have my face on it? And it turns out it's, it's got nothing to do with you. But how does this apply? So I can tell the stories, but what we can say about this is I show you a plot. You can, as humans, interpret it and possibly pick out what might be outliers. So this is an example of one week in the NFL season. I think it was 2018 or 20. It was probably 2019 season. And I picked out just uh, passing yards, which is on the x-axis and points scored on the y-axis. And we can kind of see, yeah, there's an increasing positive relationship with passing yards versus points scored. And that it looks like there were a couple of outliers, a couple of uh, cases where a lot of passing yards, not so many points scored in that week. So we can naturally tell this story and see it very easily. We can even imagine a line that goes through and cuts through this. I could also draw this line using a best fit curve, which actually moves the line. And if you look at it, you say, oh, that line's a little bit lower than what I expected to be, if we assume that these two points are actually outliers and um, are not necessarily indicative of the behavior of the normal pattern versus that there is naturally a lot of variance and that this line should actually be like a wide band. So okay, those were more intuitive, kind of a getting an understanding of how it is that we can see these points and why it is that we see these points. But that's not gonna be good enough for computers. Just being able to say, I'll know it when I see it, just uh, you should know it when you see it as well, doesn't work well for machines. Instead, we need something a little bit more concrete. We need something that is uh, based on statistics and mathematics. And couple places that we can use statistics and mathematics to help us understand, does this look weird? One of them is if we have a distribution of the data. So we have a lot of data points and we see that most of this follows what looks like a normal, a fairly normal curve, uh, but that there are a few points out here. This is roughly eight standard deviations from the norm, from the mean. Well, just to give you a quick feeling, if this really is data based off of a normal curve, a data point, eight standard deviations from the mean will occur once every something like four trillion data points. And the fact that I have several that are right out here is an indication to me that, oh, that data set, that, those points don't look like they follow from the same distribution as this data. 
which is a definition of what is an outlier? Something that does not follow from the same distribution as my regular data set. So that's another definition. Another definition, we have this notion of a box plot. Box plots are great. What they show us is big uh, flat, uh, fat line right here, that's the 50th percentile, the median, the midpoint. We have the 75th and 25th percentiles. So that box represents 50% of the data points, the middle 50% of the data points. We have whiskers that come down. These represent um, data points that are within 1.5 times the size of this box, the interquartile range. So then if you have a point which is more than 1.5 times the size of this box down from the 25th percentile or up from the 75th, you have outliers. Third technical definition of an outlier. Uh, these are all different. They will end up possibly giving you different results, which is why when it comes to anomaly detection, we don't want to look at just one algorithm and say this is the only way to do it. They will give us different results, and we are going to have to try to understand uh, when things fit and when things don't. So it goes back to at some point, humans are probably getting involved. So now let's talk a little bit more about technique. Intuition on techniques. There are dozens and dozens of these things. There are entire books on different techniques for anomaly detection in different contexts. So univariate, multivariate anomaly detection. We have time series data, non-time series data. We have uh, uh, quite a few sorts of examples of different algorithms that will help us along the way. But what we typically see is, number one, Points that are clustered near to each other tend to be less likely to be anomalous. Going back to that law of proximity, that actually plays really well for us because if you have a bunch of points and you plot them spatially, the things that are spatially near to each other are more likely to be related to each other than the things that are spatially distant. And therefore, if you have a large cluster of things, that's not an outlier. If you have two large clusters of things, those, that's not an outlier, that's just you have two clusters. So when you have enough data points, it's no longer an outlier, it is just another example of normal. Which leads to the second point. There are relatively few outliers that we would expect. I don't expect a data set has 50% outliers. If you have 50% outliers, you just have really widespread. Uh, if you have 3% outliers, yeah, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty normal. I would, you could normally say eh, five to 10% of data is probably going to fit in that range of outlier of that a small percentage will be interesting outliers and thus anomalies. When we're dealing with time series data, changes tend not to be drastic from point to point. So like for example, if I'm tracking uh, the accelerator, the acceleration of my vehicle, uh, I know that acceleration and velocity and distance are all, uh, one is the integral of the other is the integral of the other and therefore if I have a ma major increase in acceleration, it will increase velocity, but that velocity won't move as quickly and distance won't move as quickly. And therefore, I should not see my velocity when I jam down on the pedal on my car, it, velocity should not go from zero miles per hour to 180 miles per hour to 74 to 63 to 196. Um, if so, my, my, my um, speedometer is a little broken. I should probably get it fixed. But we should expect to see some level of consistency in our data. If, it if we do see those spikes, then it's going to tell us either we've got bad signal, we're not getting the information correctly, or uh, we can't interpret what we are receiving correctly. Maybe it's that we're not capturing it over a good enough time frame. Because if I track it like once a day, oh, well, my car is currently going 95 miles per hour right now, because in North Carolina, who cares if you're speeding? Um, then you go to the Virginia border and it's like, oh, now it went down to exactly the speed limit. It's so weird. So trends and seasonality can also affect analysis. And we need to remove any trend. We need to remove seasonality, deal with that before we have a check. Uh, so for example, if you have terms that are frequently searched for in winter and not in summer, the fact that it is now winter and you see a spike doesn't mean that anything special happened. It just means it's winter. 
One calculation of variance in our data is called the standard deviation. It's technically the square root of the variance. And the idea here is that as your standard deviation grows, the expected set of values also grows. So if I have this blue curve, this red curve, this green curve, all of them have a mean of 50. All of them uh, meet in the middle here. But if I tell you that we had a value of 90 and we're looking at this using the blue data set, 90 is a very uncommon value. It's, it may be an outlier, it may be anomalous. On the red set, it's like, oh, it's, it's probably unlikely. It may be an outlier. On the green set, it's just another value. So as our standard deviation increases, the ability to tell any given point is an outlier decreases. For a normal distribution in particular, we have this rough calculation that 68% of our values should be within one standard deviation of the mean. 95% are within two standard deviations, 99.7 are within three standard deviations. So what this tells us is that if we set the definition of what is an outlier as more than three standard deviations from the mean, assuming that we have a normal distribution, we get roughly three in a thousand data points that are outliers. So we expect that many. Of those, how many are possibly interesting? I mean, all of them could be possibly interesting, but some of them will be just at that edge. It's like, yeah, okay, you've got a one in 10,000 chance of hitting that, but I have a million data points. I'm gonna hit one in 10,000 chances pretty frequently. Versus cases of eight standard deviations where it was one in something like four trillion, different story. But standard deviation does have a problem. Uh, there is a downside, it is sensitive to an outlier. Every new outlier provides new information and that new information extends the standard deviation. So with a few outliers, we can completely blow out standard deviation and make it such that we're not getting good results anymore. What we can do to fix that is uh, use something called median absolute deviation. This is an example of a robust statistic. The definition of robust statistics are statistics that are not as vulnerable to small numbers of outliers as the classical statistics. So the median absolute deviation is based off of medians. It's basically the, the difference of medians um, in your data. And what's really nice about this is in the calculation of a median, the 50th percentile, we automatically strike out the furthest edges to figure out what that median is. So outliers, which are at your furthest edges, get struck out earliest, which means that uh, we're less sensitive to a single outlier. And also an outlier in each direction, if you're thinking about a number line, opposite directions cancel each other out. So I can have several outliers here, several outliers here, and still have it not seriously affect my uh, ability to check is the next data point an outlier as well. Now, suppose we've got a trend. There's an anomalous jump. So we have a trend, it is already going up, and we had some jump that we recognize this is anomalous. But the question is, how much of this jump is anomalous and how much of this is trend? Because we expected some amount up. And also, is this last data point, is that actually anomalous or not? Really hard to tell, because if I'm eyeballing it, you know, I can, depending on how, how straight I can keep this, um, this pointer, I might have an answer, eh, maybe, maybe not. So how do we figure this out? Well, first things first, we gotta calculate our trend, and usually we build a trend line. We try to estimate what is the uh, expected value on here, knowing that you will have jumps up and down along the trend line. Then we tilt our heads kinda like this, and now we have a straight line, and once we have a straight line, then the difference between this point and the straight line, that is our difference. So that's what we're looking at as uh, how far off of the line we are. And then we can check, you know, given this set of data points where they're all very close to the line and we had our anomalous situation, we can see we haven't quite returned back to normality or what we expect to be the normal result. When it comes to time series, I mentioned that we don't expect radical changes in short periods of time. And that's why many techniques focus on a concept known as change point detection. So change point detection is looking for abrupt shifts in time series data. And the red spots here indicate three sections where we had abrupt changes. We had you know, a smooth increase and then a major jump and then a major drop. So we had these periods where I had sort of um, series one, series two, 
kind of back to series one, series three, kind of back to series one, uh, maybe series four. And we may look at this and say, these are probably not coming from the same device. They're not, they're not uh, similar signals. We have something interesting going on here. We can also take all of this advice and apply it not only to the values themselves, but if we're talking time series, you know, we also care about what is the difference between our current point and the prior point. Well, we can calculate those differences. We can apply the same results to them, do the same types of calculations, and uh, possibly find something that may have been hidden within our time series data that we're able to apply to the differences themselves. So all right, I've got about five minutes left where I can talk about uh, anomaly detector. I will give you a point that first I would recommend instead of building your own, definitely go check out libraries first because there are plenty of these in R, in Python, in .NET. Pick your language, you're going to find something probably that will help you with this. If you're in Python, I highly recommend PyOD. It is an outstanding library for this. If you're in the .NET world, ML.NET does a, an adequate job. <laughs> they are definitely behind the curve. Um, if you're in the R world, the anomalize, anomalize is actually a great library as well. But let's say I, A, I'm in .NET, B, I seriously have to roll my own. Um, for this, there's a, a set of libraries called MathNet, math.net. And these are statistical libraries that allow you to create things, sort, some of these tests in one line of code. Um, they're really nice in C-sharp. They're really nice in F-sharp. They actually have F-sharp specific development that helps make it easier. And m many of these tests that I talked about that tell you are, do you have something that's an outlier, are one-liners in math.net. So nice to do. Um, another alternative I will show you briefly, just a couple minutes, uh, ml.net. ML.net, if you want to set it up yourself, I have instructions on how to do that. But you create a new console application in the language F Sharp because that is the best .NET language. And then we create a new package. Uh, we add packages, Microsoft.ml and time series data set. And very, very briefly, uh, I've got some code. I'm not going to go through the code just because we only have two minutes left. But you can grab the code. I will give you a link to it. Um, it will show you how to create a data table, basically a Python style pandas data table in uh, .NET. Read a CSV, the data set example, I figured when I created this talk, what was the most anomalous thing that I could think of? And the answer is GameStop uh, stock prices. <laughs> and so the code is essentially doing this anomaly detection, building it up, and by the way, this is the pricing, it was from uh, 2020 going into when when everybody had diamond hands um, and it did peak at like three hundred and seventy dollars per share uh, and then it dropped down a, uh, about a hundred and some dollars the next day but what's real interesting in this is I'm gonna undo the change points let's just show anomalies um, we have some anomalies you have basically like every day was an anomaly here and then you have this entire stretch where it said you know what I'm done with anomalies any any value is possible forget about it so uh, that that was GameStop all right over the course of this talk which is just about up uh, we did look at the concept of anomalies we did talk about some techniques for detecting them I kind of hinted at there's this .NET package that makes it a little bit easier for us if you want to grab the code if you want to grab slides links to additional information it is all csmore.info slash on slash anomalies please do feel free to talk to me afterwards email address is here Twitter handle again I'll be right over here for most of the day if you want to pay me to have your company do stuff like this and with that thank you everybody <laughs>